Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Opinionated SEO Opinions and this time we are together with Daniel Chong from Adobe. Hello Daniel. Hello, hello, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much, it's lovely having you. Would you like to give us a quick intro of yourself? Sure. Now, quick is subjective, right? <laughs> but but here's, the, uh, here's the very short version. I'm Daniel. I've been in SEO for ooh, only five years, learned ground up like most of you, uh, self-taught, knew very little, uh, still very, know very little, uh, but now I work uh, client side for Adobe, but not the creative cloud side. I work on another cloud, which is more to do with the business.adobe.com side of things. So your AEMs, your customer data platforms, the B2B stuff. Um, and I will, at the time of recording, I've been there for only four short weeks. So it's a lot of learning, a lot of absorbing. Um, and prior to that, I was working in another enterprise, a telco here in Australia. Oh, FYI, I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Um, and yeah, that, that's probably all you need to know at this stage before I become very opinionated. <laughs> that sounds great. Love you, um, love it. And I'm going to, but I am going to call you out on trying to say you don't know much. You have made phenomenal strides in your career and I'm super excited to have you on here because your expertise is definitely one of a kind. So do not sell yourself short. Thanks, Sam. I'm like, I'm not selling myself short. It's just, I think as we'll all agree here, the more you learn, the more you realize you're just scratching the surface. And especially when it comes to SEO and don't even get me into machine learning. Like, I don't even understand that stuff, but that's the stuff that we work with. So that's why I say I don't know much, but at the same time, I do know enough. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> well, I know today we're going to be talking about what I think is one of your favorite subjects of schema <laughs> and also one of mine. Um, so, uh, we ready to hop in and get started? Oh my God. Yes. Let's have a drink. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't say I love schema. Love is a very strong word. I love That's my fair. wife. I love my dog. Uh, schema is just something that I fell into. And let's just jump into it, right? I, I fell into schema because of a very basic reason. I wanted to know how I can connect or nest FAQ page schema to the broader web page schema. And I knew this was a thing because back in my agency day, some really smart guy told me, you should nest schema. But no one, like when you Google, how do you nest schema? You, you don't find any resources. So for the last three years, I've been trying to figure that out. Hmm. And so come Christmas last year, uh, I decided, you know what? I'm going to learn this thing. Like I knew FAQ page schema. I knew how to uh, abuse it <laughs> for CTR reasons. Um, but again, I wanted to, do schema or semantic SEO or entity-based search the, you know, air quotes again, the right way. And so, again, I, I turn to Google. That's what all of us and developers do, right? We go to Google and ask, how do you do something? And yeah. none of the stuff that I came across showed me. They explained the abstract theory behind it. But when mm -hmm. I actually wanted to know how do I connect two certain things together, there was nothing that I could find. And so me not knowing how to code, like literally I do not know how to code, I realized, okay, maybe it's time to dive in and learn a bit of JSON LD. I don't even know what that is, but apparently that's a syntax. Is, Sam is yeah. probably cringing. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> do you even SEO, bro? It's like, I don't know. I do not expect SEOs to understand JSON. Uh, in fact, I would say if... If you know what it stands for, I would be amazed because why would anybody need to know that? You don't. You just don't. <laughs> what does the LD stand for then? So actually, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I can write in JavaScript, but I have no idea what the LD means. But it's Ooh, not important. Okay. Great. Was I, I didn't know that. Now I have. Now I know. <laughs> But, yeah, that's okay. So this is why you got into it. You started digging because nobody else was really doing it. So with that knowledge, when you're looking at a site and trying to figure out schema opportunities, what does that initial audit look like for you? Uh, okay. So typically speaking, I, I wouldn't audit schema. It, it's very low on the scale of priorities. 
but recently because I have been you know pushing this whole semantic SEO agenda for so long on LinkedIn that people come to me about it and so uh, a few months ago a site Bob's watchers reached out to me and said hey our traffic's tanking can you look into it and there were a whole host of issues but one of the other things I'd also realized was they were using different types of solutions, plugins and otherwise, to generate or dynamically generate their schema, specifically product schema. And on certain pages, mostly their money pages or money category pages, there were like 36 different products being described. And so I was like, it, in theory, this makes sense. Like Google can make sense of this. But in essence, what you're describing and what you're communicating to a search engine is this thing you've come across is 60, 36 products. Okay, so which one of it is important? Or what about the page itself? What about the other stuff? And so when I, you know, back to your question, Sam, how do I audit schema? It's it's quite simple. You, you grab the page, you put it into uh, schema.org's validator tool, and then you see, A, are there any errors? If not, great, move on. And then do you, then you look at the issues, because sometimes you can also have issues, but they're not necessarily errors. And then if there are no issues, great. So syntactically, that all makes sense. But then you look at it and you take one huge step back and you go, okay, what exactly is this structured data telling a search engine? And that's where I have to put my foot down. And this is where the opinion comes in and, and say, yes, you can get rich results from having your product schema expressed a certain way, but maybe the better way to do this and, you know, there's a charge word here, like right way of doing it, is to nest all that product within a schema type of, let's say, collection page so that mm. on a very basic level for a search engine, it knows exactly what it's going to pass on that page before it renders it and then go, okay, it's here. Cool. It's all good. Um, so that's how I would audit, audit uh, schema. But uh, let, let's be really honest here. Schema isn't a direct ranking factor. And if you were to implement semantic SEO very well and invest 40, 60, 8, you know, 80 hours into it, you shouldn't see a huge increase in traffic or rankings. Uh, and so that's the interesting conversation of how do you get buy-in? Like, what is the purpose of this anyway? And, and that's a very different conversation, which maybe we'll dive into. For but sure. I don't want to, but I'm sure we will. Yes, we will. <laughs> Let's take a look at the software solutions and creative approaches that you take when you're like implementing schema. I assume when you, you're using nested schema and graphs and stuff, it is very difficult and complex to like automate them all or like fit them into a tool that you're using. So probably you are using something custom or at least you are sharing some sort of details with the developers. So walk us through that, please. That's a very good question. Uh, I don't use much complicated tools, in my opinion anyway. I, I essentially use Visual Studio Code or Visual Code Studio, one of those things. Hence, mm -hmm. I'm not a coder. Uh, and, and that just puts interesting colors so that you know if you've written something <laughs> right or wrong. But essentially, uh, there are a multitude of software solutions that do this for you out of the box already. Uh, in fact, when I was first trying to learn how to connect one schema type to another, I came across Rank Math's premium tool. So this is more for your WordPress sites. And they have an ability where you can essentially build block by block or schema type by schema type of whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And that was like interesting, but because I don't understand the syntax or the vocabulary at that stage, how can you build something when you don't even know what each building block is. And so that's why I dove into the actual, actual JSON LD itself. But then you have WordLift, that is a, a tool that will actually build a knowledge graph using entities on your website itself. Then you have Schema App, which has been the solution for a very long time that can do this for you at an enterprise level. Um, and then I guess if we're talking about, if you wanna look in the real world, how someone else has built this logic out and automated it, uh, Investopedia have done it really, really well. I don't know how they've done it, but they have done it. If you go to any informational page that links to a money page or even perhaps a commercial page itself, you'll see that almost every single component content-wise on that page has been marked up with schema and it mm -hmm. connects to each other. 
And so someone very smart has already designed what the logic looks like and how if it's put into a field on the back end, whatever platform they're using, then that translate to X, Y, Z type of schema and the properties that it should spit out. And I believe uh, Lydia has also done that to some extent for Sanity, for some of their product pages where you can have, it will go, oh, this is a question-based heading. Okay, then we're going to put that as FAQ schema and then it's going to grab the first paragraph and put that as the answer. So there are, of course, ways to do this. And I think, again, I'm not a coder, but most developers, if you tell them what needs to be done and what the variables are, it's a piece of cake, right, Sam? It's a piece of It's easy, right? Generally, yeah. <laughs> this this part is, um, so I will say working with your dev teams, I've generally had a lot of success because, like you say, it's a little bit easier. Uh, one of the biggest things I think that makes it easy is that we're not trying to dictate where in the page the JSON has to go. The biggest things I've seen though is a lot of the dev teams I've worked with, and maybe it's just because I'm also a developer that they're like, hey, I need you to write an example of what it should look like. Mm -hmm. um, so usually, uh, you know, Daniel, you're mentioning a lot of those great tools that will help auto-generate schema for you. There are tons of generators out there. I do feel you, though, on there's less available tools, I think, um, or like readily available when it comes to nesting things. Like um, just this past week, I had to write an example schema with like a collection page, all of the nested products and FAQ. <laughs> like, All so of like, the nested oh, products. Are you watching me this week? Is that what's happening? Um, <laughs> so, like pulling and pricing and review information, all that good stuff. Um, so, you know, usually they do want to see an example, um, but I love that you just called out like Investopedia does a great job. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good examples out there. So you can always kind of lean on those. Um, now you said you dug really into JSON. Is there ever a time that you were digging into microdata or RDFA? No, it was, I don't even know what that stuff is. Well, I do, but for some reason, JSON made sense because as you said earlier, just now, Sam, for devs, it's easier because I've just learned that if you were to do microdata or RFDA, it goes into the page source itself and it can break things was of where it goes. Whereas mm -hmm. what we're doing with JSON LD, you just you, you shove it into a script tag and then technically you could put it anywhere in the body, in the footer, preferably in the head, but it can go anywhere. And that makes it a lot easier because it's almost a separate thing that gets injected into another thing. Whereas if you're playing around with microdata, then there's all those interesting item prop things, then that can, you know, or because of that, you know, thinking, Another step further is, let's say another component on your web page updates automatically and it what like, overrides all that microdata. Then it's like, well, that sucks, doesn't it? Because then you have to start sure all does. over again. <laughs> yeah, so I remember when, because I'm old, um, <laughs> but I remember when uh, schema, the preferred method was microdata. And we had to write Painful those days. into everything. And there was something that was nice about that because, like, you could manually do it in your blogs or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to add JSON, I think, you know, if you don't write JavaScript, which, you know, I firmly believe that SEOs do not have to have those skills to be successful 100%. Um, but, you know, that can obviously make it a little bit harder, can make it harder to diagnose when something's wrong, right, and really be able to to figure out how to fix it. Um, so that was kind of the nice part about microdata. I'll be honest, I have never messed around with RDFA. Nah, whatever. Um, but, yeah, I do. I like what you say about JSON really, you know, it's more developer friendly. I think also another reason it's always made sense to me is that it really is just that, well, it's JSON. So you have a characteristic and a value or an it's really an attribute and a value. And that just makes sense because you're like, now I'm describing my thing and I'm describing the most important or the priority data points about my thing. And I think something that people miss, and I love what you're talking about with like semantically connecting those things, when you create that web of understanding of your content, even just as a marketer, now I suddenly have a better handle of what my website is about and what am I talking about? And you know, sometimes you're even also able to see like, oh, there's no connection between topic A and topic D. How do I how do I connect those so that this makes more sense and I can show more relevance? Um, I just love like the holistic view that you sometimes have to get 
or honestly, not sometimes, that you need to get to really effectively put this in um, and get your, your entity juice out of it, I guess is what we'll call it. Um, entity juice. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, I just coined it. It's fine. <laughs> oh, the imagery. Now it's safe filterings on. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I want to well, take a know, huge link step juice, back entity here. juice. Oh. You know why not? Why not? Yes. By the way, I hate the phrase. Why not? Juice. Yeah, why not? I think I'm for those not... of you who are listening, and and you know, schema, it means a certain thing in the context of SEO, but it's not specific to SEO because schema, if you actually Google it, is more about linguistics and this goes back to my previous life where i was studying to be a speech pathologist and that's when i first came across this concept of schema and that is it's a way to describe something so let's for example uh, imagine you're trying to explain to an alien what a dog is it's an animal okay but there are many types of animals okay it had four legs but there are many animals with four legs okay it has a tail but at the same time, there's animals with four legs with a tail. And so the more specific you get, then that way of describing what it is using those attributes or properties, that is schema. And schema makes up the lexicon or the words in our language. And for whatever reason, English is a really stupid and confusing language. Yet oh, it is you know, the biggest language. There's so much ambiguity. Doug could mean many things. And so... For a search engine, like let's say Google, they, they've figured most of those things out. But let's say you are working in a specific vertical in finance or health or whatever, and you want to really drill down into what this page is about or what your website in general is about. This is where schema comes in. You're trying to describe certain things so that Google doesn't have to rely on its assumptions on what it thinks you're doing so that you're just connecting the dots for them and so that they can help you. That is the purpose of schema. It's not about gaming the system to get certain higher click-through rates or more visibility on the SERPs, although that is something on a tactical level you can do. It's more about the essential optimization for a literal search engine itself. That's mm -hmm. schema and that's semantic SEO. Yeah, I, I love that because that's one of the things Absolutely. Yeah. And the power of schema, like it's a closed language set. That's essentially what we're offering. And that's, there's so much power in that. Like, I remember one of the first times I implemented it, it was like, I was able to go into, it was for a, a local service company that did house painting. And so we were able to drill down into not only is it a local business, but you can actually specify house painter. And this was also, uh, so I'm going to date myself. This is before hummingbird. So before we had um, semantic search. And, you know, so this is the days of like the many ways that people spell house, by the way, uh, it's uh, alarming how people spell house. Um, you know, you had to have a page dedicated to each way that house is spelled like house painter. I mean, it was ludicrous. Uh, Y'all should have seen when we had to do it for refrigerators. That was, I think I had like 30 different pages because refrigerator is just an impossible word to spell. But and still has no meaning to me. But like when we were able to do that, like you're able to drill down into with such specificity about this is what this organization or this page is talking about and just have an understanding of like, I know that Google now understands that you are a house painter because it's here and like that it's very clearly documented. Um, but yeah, I love your analogy of putting it with like, how would you describe a dog to an alien? Um, it's really just bringing all of that together. And I could, we could probably have a whole nother episode about how stupid the English language is. And actually I would love to do that. <laughs> it makes no sense. It really it doesn't. And it yet doesn't. we will understand it. So that, that's what Google is trying to achieve or most search, engines, most search engines are trying to achieve through NLP and all those words that I will say to make myself sound smart, but I actually don't know how they work. That's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> and I would have opinions as so, a non-native speaker on that, but yeah, mm -hmm. as you said, another episode, definitely. And Let's you raise a very interesting tangential yet very 
relevant thing is, as we are all aware, Google tends to serve English content better because it understands it better. But how do you apply schema to multilingual sites? Or like JSON-LD is written in English, right, Sam? Like you can't literally write it in another language, right? Can you? I don't know. Well, you can put it in the field, in the value. Mm. You can put in the value, but it won't make any sense to whoever's passing it. So again, it comes down to this interesting dynamic of maybe you could use English-based JSON-LD to describe your website that is in German or in another language that serves your target audience very well, but Google doesn't quite figure it out because it doesn't care as much, for a lack of a better word. I don't think you're wrong. Um, I will say we've actually done some tests on that. Um, so I will say from my experience, I learned, yes, you go ahead and keep the JSON structure and, you know, the, the attributes, those don't change. Like it's still going to be mm -hmm. ID, name, URL, yep. right? Postal address, right? Mm. It's just kind mm. of a weird phrase in and of itself. Um, but the values we did put in, when I put them mm. in the actual language, um, we saw better success rates of that affecting cert features than if we translated them into English. Um, so just a that is cool. Up. I'm um, going to use that. Actually, how does that play with hreflang? As someone who doesn't very understand how hreflang should be done. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, so yeah, when we uh, so these are for international clients who have multiple versions of pages. Um, so we did we made sure that the hreflang was implemented correctly way before we tested structured data. Um, but, and I will say the site that we did this test on was such a large site that their href, I'm never, I always have a hard time saying this. Okay. Hreflang. I can type it. That's what matters. Um, that one, we actually put it in the XML sitemap because when we tried to link all the different versions, they actually had over 200 languages. So that would just make the HTML really large. <laughs> so we, we did the XML sitemap implementation for it. Um, so yeah, we made sure that that was all sound um, and they had a, you know, it's a large enough site that they had a custom CMS and all that kind of stuff that naturally linked things together. Um, actually not naturally, it was a very manual process, but it happened. Um, and so that's how we were able to test it. And yeah, we saw, um, or like we even have, um, they had some pages that were in English, but for different markets. So mm -hmm. let's say it might be the English site for German users because the content had to be a little bit different because of local laws. And also the product itself is a little bit different from like the US version. Um, so we definitely saw like when that was in English, cert features were okay, but the German version with the German notation did a lot better. Um, so yeah, that was just the test that we ran. Um, hreflang, it all, kind of like canonicals should be treated separately than structured data, I think. Hmm. Um, so ideally, if you are having to implement structured data across the board for a multilingual site, um, whatever values would be populating your structured data would still be translated in each version and like would be custom fields or however you need to build it. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's it kind does. of the experiences we had with it. Cause that's what I need to do at Adobe. <laughs> <laughs> your whole sounds, sounds <laughs> difficult, but yes, someone's done it before. So I, yes, I'll push ahead. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, I, I well, so that's the kind of work I love. I think it was really fun. It was very nerdy, but it was really fun to basically have all the spreadsheets and just like, all right, do I have all 262 versions of this time? <laughs> <laughs> um, also really fun because sometimes I would look at like the symbols and I'll just call myself out. I, I am a linguist. I speak multiple languages, but sometimes I would look at something and I'm like, I have no idea what this is. I don't, I couldn't even tell you what language it is. I don't even know. So yeah, sometimes that got difficult. Um, but thankfully we work with really awesome people who know those things much better than me. Well, so we've been talking a little bit about like how the complexities and like 
it should work as long as you are in control of what you're doing and you can deliver it to the developers, yes. But are there any common shortfalls within schema implementation to steer clear of because of the potential issues downstream at scale? Many things can go wrong. And, and this is an interesting conversation I had very recently. And that was, and it's something that a lot of us as SEOs fall in trap of is that we don't have the correct KPIs. And so we default to traffic as being a success metric. But, but here's the thing, right? Most pages, let's say it's, it's going after a large category or broad topic. It's going to get a lot of traffic because let's say you have topical coverage. So it's going to get from the initial stage, top of the funnel, all the way to the bottom of the funnel, if you've addressed those things. Now, let's say the purpose of that content is to lead towards a conversion. What if through your structured data markup, you've specified who it is for, what it's about, and why it's important to that particular person or your ICP, ideal customer profile. And so Google, let's say it treats all of those things as you've intended, and it goes, okay, I'm going to cut out or the top of the funnel stuff, because that's not your intended audience. I understand what this content is about and who it's for. And therefore, I'm going to serve it to people who are much towards the cons well, the comparison or the ready to commit phase of their buyer's journey. And so suddenly, as we all know about head terms and that broad topic, that's like 90% of the traffic. And so what if your page tanks, but your conversions go up, but you're reporting consistently on traffic and then your VP or your client goes, why is our traffic tanking? And you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> and you so what if, what if we were doing all the right things and we were achieving the goals, but because the story you've been telling and the reporting that you've been doing has been wrong? Mm -hmm. Something to think about. That's what could for go sure. wrong. Yeah. So I'd say for us, whenever I do like a big structured data, project, if you will, uh, we usually look at CTR rates, like that's what I'm trying to measure and see if that improves at all. Um, are there other metrics that are typically your, like obviously conversions, you know, for most, I think for most SEOs were, you know, if your agency side, it's a lot of B2B, B2C, you're looking for e-commerce or transactions, like what are some of the other go-to metrics for you? Ah, I, let's say, well, for B2B or B2C, I like branded search, especially branded search plus a product. And if I see that, whether it's reflected in impressions or clicks, or hopefully CTR improve across time as a result of all your initiatives, then that for me is a proxy to convey somewhat of a success. Uh, the other things all ladder up into that. Um, and so... For me, it's definitely the branded stuff because that's typically when you think again of the multi touch points that anyone makes when they make a decision, the last type of query they may search for maybe three months later or even two years later is, mm -hmm. oh, brand recall. And then what's the product or the solution? And so I like to measure that as opposed to the generic, let's say informational pages where we're trying to, oh, get more clicks and impressions for generic queries. Yes, that's great. What's the so what? And that's a little bit more different. Well, I guess it depends on what stage of that business and SEO and all the marketing channels are at because there is a case to start talking about rankings and traffic because that's you're at the beginning page. But let's say it's an established brand, has product market fit, has all that stuff, and they spend you know millions on paid. Then so your success Adobe. metrics are... <laughs> Most brands. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> By the way, you should totally sign up for AM if you know. No. Um, ah, so, Sorry. yeah, it, it comes down to who is asking for progress and tailoring that language to them because everyone asks for different things. And that may change. I think that's something across the board for SEOs. We, mm. need, we need to do better about answering the so what right and also keeping that as your north star like there's there's so many times where i've seen like where i've seen people want to do this thing because it's considered best practice and it's like but what business goal are you helping 
like that needs to come back to the bigger piece. And I think at that point, once we operate more like that, we may also see SEOs become more integrated into the business units and be less of like the, oh, well, those are the kids who play on Google all the time and, you know, sacrifice lambs. I don't know. Um, yeah. No goats were harmed in the making of this episode. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, you know, because I do think there's just a lot about SEO that people don't understand. So, you know, our almost our entire profession is treated like black magic. And I think there are unfortunately less great doers in our space that they are a little bit of doing that like snake oil sales piece, right, that we have to overcome. And I, I will say, having done this for 13 plus years, it has definitely shifted and I am seeing a lot less of that than I used to, which is really fantastic. Um, but yeah, as we do better at really applying ourselves to the overall business goals and really integrating ourselves into those, we're going to see more support come through. Um, because it is just, and I'm totally biased cause I love it, but it is such a powerful channel and such a powerful tool. Um, and it's just, you know, for most of our clients, it's always the number one revenue generator. Yes, and always. Like I said, I've been doing time. this for 13 years. Mm -hmm. It always is. So. Yeah. And, and that's something that I think when I was first starting out, and it makes sense, right? You're, you're trying to learn all the things. You look for all the issues and how to fix them. But what's the so what? And it comes down to learning who is hiring you, who is actually, who's pitched, let's say agency side, someone internally has pitched for a budget and got it and wants something. Uh, what does their skip, skip boss want? Like, what was the promise to be made? Have you even had that conversation? Because let's say an SEO manager or marketing manager has gotten, let's say, 60, 80K per year for the next financial year for, for an agency. And they're like, okay, Great. And then most agencies were, okay, let's do an audit. Why? Uh, so what if you find all the things? What are the, all these things going to achieve? And that's the same thing with schema. Like for me, do I, at what stage do I pitch schema as an independent consultant? At what point do I pitch schema internally here at Adobe? Uh, those are the things that you need to be very careful of and mindful of when you're making recommendations. And back to your point, Sam, it's like, what I found successful, and this is something that I learned probably the hard way at my previous role at Optus, was uh, you don't call things SEO. <laughs> you find what other people care about. What are their big bets that they've promised their bosses? And you go, with your understanding of how web and humans work, how do you integrate SEO into those same things? Because digital web and SEO, they're all interconnected. So don't call it SEO necessarily. Get your stuff into their tickets, get your stuff into their priorities, and SEO will get served. And you can tell the success story from their perspective for them. And that's how you get that long-term uh, cadence where SEO is not treated as a, we tried it, it didn't work. It's more, oh, it works in different facets of our business. We love it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just becomes ingrained in that organization or business that, okay, we don't truly understand SEO. There's the, that team or that person who does it, uh, but they've been showing us results. We love them. We won't cut their budget yet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we know they exist and the importance they carry. And I think one of our biggest issues as SEOs, we try to explain everything, right? We try to cover our bases because it depends, doesn't help anyone. But then we go into this big manifesto of if X, then Y, Y, then Z. But sometimes just be simple. And that's where you can fall in the trap of oversimplifying things. But there's always context as to why sometimes you have to oversimplify and get to just the doing. Well, so you recommend nesting SEO under different departments so that you can get buy-in? Actually, can you clarify what you're asking? That sounds a little similar to like schema strategy that you have, like nesting everything, like identifying the relationship between right. different parts of your um, schema and web page. So within your organization, you are trying to nest schema under different departments whenever you're speaking to them. So kind of like wearing different yep. hats to get buy-in and just justify what you're going to do and stuff. Love it. Great. Okay. 
I understand now. Yes. So like Adobe and most enterprise or large organizations, different business units, different budgets, different heads of, uh, and rolling out something site-wide rarely happens unless all the fires are burning and this one solution will fix it. Schema is not going to fix most of those things because we are addressing entities and relationships. Now, I, from my perspective for Adobe or the business doc, Adobe subdomain, does Google understand the entities related to it? Yes and no. Could it be improved? Definitely. How could we improve that? What are the levers at my control? Well, content's going to do that. The IA is relatively okay. I've been told that some people have fought the battles before me and now I'm reaping the benefits. So the subfolder structures is all is relatively clean. Um, and for context, you know, business Adobe, it's, it's an acquisition machine. It just buys products and then folds it into its main parent company. And so for me to get semantic SEO across business.adobe and hopefully even adobe.com is I need to find one business unit that cares. It might not be the one that I'm directly working with, but it might be a tangential one somewhere else. And then help that SEO and their developers to get that live and measure that and then report on the results on that through their team that flows across to mine. And then I can show, hey, we did this. It took X amount of resources and across Y timeline, we saw this difference. And that's how I would build that business case or buy-in to roll it out for another business unit and another one because every business unit, every subfolder essentially has its own goals and they're, they're really that aligned. Yes, uh, they all want to make more sales, but how they make that sale is, is very different. And so that I think makes sense for most large organizations. Now, if you're looking from a smaller business where it's, it's kind of one big line of multiple services or products, then that argument is maybe a little bit easier but it comes down to again to your forecasting to your hypothesis of if i pull this lever how long will it take how much will it cost and when can we start seeing that uplift and what does that uplift mean and look like and that really applies to all types of marketing right yeah yeah absolutely so with that, let me ask, what are the nuances worth noting specific to schema implementation for SaaS products? Because I think that's kind of like a connected but different sphere question that we can touch upon. Hmm. So yes, SaaS products traditionally have had difficulty being described with schema. Uh, but there is, there's a schema type called web application that you can use. It is a child of software application that is a child of something else and something else but short story is everything comes to this thing called a thing because that is what an entity is so a web application is a sub 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 subset of a thing because it's literally a thing and so with a web application it comes with a few distinct and unique attributes that you can use to describe it and the biggest challenge for SaaS products is that you want probably a rich result. You want when someone searches for your product and solution to have all this stuff showed up. And so how do you do that with structured data? Well, you use the web application schema type, and then that allows you to describe certain things. But you don't describe it as a product per se. You describe it as an offer. And if you have multiple offers, then you use aggregate offer. And that's the same with pricing and reviews. Uh, but essentially, that's how you get around the, oh, this is not, this is a service, like literally software as a service, but it's not quite a traditional sense of what Google understands as a service, like as a dentist. And it's definitely not a physical product, like from an e-commerce. And so web application schema type is the best workaround at the time of recording. It may change in time, and hopefully it does, that allows... SaaS companies to mark up their products so that it tells search engines that this is actually a product, but it's not a traditional physical product. It's also a service that we offer, but it's not a traditional service. But when you combine the two, that's essentially what a SaaS product is. And that's how you can use schema to convey what that is. Now, how much does Google interpret that or want to interpret that? That is a whole different discussion. But if you, at the beginning, describe those elements on each of your 
product pages for a SaaS, then you are ahead of the competition because you have conveyed certain elements of what you offer better than your counterparts. And that's always, you know, something nice to have. It really is challenging when you don't have specific surf features that you can report on, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like if you put it into rich results tests, it goes, yeah, there's code here, but we don't know what it is. It's like, okay, great. Cool. Yeah. I mean, oh, you... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely fingers crossed situation. Yeah. Well, that was a wonderful way of putting it. And thank you for all the information. So wrapping up this episode, I am going to ask you what has been the biggest challenge or obstacle that you faced in structured data implementation. It can be something, I mean, go wild. Whatever you want to <laughs> cover oh, for it. So I, I guess I have two stories. One was when I, my first experience at an enterprise trying to test it. And so ironically, Optus was also using Adobe Experience Manager. However, the build that we got from the person who, well, the company, the consulting firm that built it was not that great. And mm -hmm. so A, I didn't even know who the devs were and B, I didn't know how to reach out to them because they were third party. But I knew that I wanted to test certain things. I wanted to get those FAQ rich results. And so the first test was, okay, let's... I know that there's Google Tag Manager on this website. So if I can add a container and a tag to the existing thing, then maybe I can test it. And so that's what I did. And of course, I don't have ownership of approving what gets pushed live in GTM. And so I'd explain that to an analytics person. And thankfully, they, they knew what I was trying to achieve and I wasn't going to break anything. And so they said, okay, it's all good. And so I wrote that in raw JSON put it in a script tag, put it into GTM, that could push live. And then unfortunately, that page, for whatever reason, that page type never triggered rich results. But at least I could grab that JSON, put it into rich results and uh, screenshot the preview. So go, okay, this is what it'll look like for this category page if we had you know, this cool rich result. And then the product owner was like, oh, this looks awesome. Let's roll it out. Okay, great. Next problem, how do we roll it out? Again, I'm not a developer. I have no understanding of AEM at this stage. And to current day, still don't really know. <laughs> As someone who works at Adobe. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going there. <laughs> it's only four weeks. Uh, You'll get it. You'll get it in yeah, the next yeah, four. Yeah, yeah. It'll be fine. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll get there. It's like WordPress right now. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Uh, no. <laughs> and so somehow I I built a relationship with who our devs were who were at a third party and I was like all I need is a way to inject something into the head. And they were like, "Okay, what do you mean?" I was like, "Oh, I want to, you know, do all this JSON stuff." And I was like, "Okay, but the dev is like, so what do you need from me?" I was like, "Uh, I don't know, but is there a way to add it in the page properties to shove it in there. I was like, oh, okay. Do you want like a raw JSON field in page properties? I was like, I don't know what that is, but yes, give it to me. And so that got added. And so I already had like the JSON built out. And so and FYI, raw JSON means it's not wrapped in the script tag. It's just the curly bracket stuff. Again, I don't know what that means, but that's what it is. So I had all those documents for a page, gave that to the next person who actually implements that stuff. And that is different organizations they're called differently but it's called a producer they copy and paste put that in the page properties and press live and thankfully through other initiatives with on-page content and internal linking some of our product pages were already on page one and so really quickly when it got recrawled and google's like okay let's add rich results to this stuff uh, i could show on live results hey this is the stuff that i was talking about uh what do you think like at this stage, not much data, but you could show the impressions of FAQ stuff, rich results. And so product owners are really happy. Let's send that up to their boss. And that was how I tested it. And that's how it is now there on that website. Now coming full circle to Adobe where I still don't understand how AEM fully works, but I want to roll out certain parts of schema. I, I am starting to have those conversations, but as expected, there are blockers. You get told no a lot. 
and for good reasons. It's not part of their rollout plan, so I need to find a way to test it. Now, obviously, we don't have Google Tag Manager. We have something else. So I need to figure out who owns that and how do I inject stuff into that to create that test. But essentially, that's the same process and pattern that I'll follow. Um, but essentially, you're testing stuff, measuring it, and telling the so what. Exciting process. Love it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, also, uh, for those who are implementing scripts through or JSON through GTM, I know it's not recommended. I get it. But frankly, sometimes I don't have another option. Um, and for now, it still works. Um, but as long as you also have the little extra that says to add it to the rendering, that's an important part of the script. Um, so maybe with this video, I'll include a few links that will take you to that. Cause like back in the day, you could just put in like the script tag with the JSON and that would work. And now you need an extra part that says, that basically says to inject it through JavaScript. So just it, a lot of people thought that meant that it wasn't working anymore. And it's really just that that shortened script version doesn't work anymore. Um, but we still use it when I can't, when I can't get devs on my side, cause it happens, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we can still do that, but also it is kind of terrifying. Cause once a dev figures out, they're like, you could literally change the entire website. I'm like, you're right. I could, it's a good thing. I'm not evil. Yeah. Um, but no, I love that and wish you the best of luck. Hopefully I'll go. I actually, I know all will go well. You've got plenty of business case and experience to make it happen. So awesome. thank you. Well, anything you want to add about schema before we wrap up? The future of schema, how is AI going to affect it? <laughs> small subject, really small. Okay, okay. If you want to learn schema, ChatGTP is great at giving you something. It may not be correct, but essentially, and, and the newer versions that can connect to the internet, scary. Mm. You can go, oh, here's a page. Can you know, you know, figure out? So you go through a series of prompts like, what is this page about? Okay, now can you explain this with schema? And that's how you can start to learn schema by just seeing how a machine would translate it or at least produce it. And then you can ask it, and this is, gets quite trippy, right? You go, okay, now pretend to be a Googlebot and you're seeing this code. What is it telling you? And then that's how you start to learn. All this stuff is not just gibberish. It does make sense. Um, and that's how you can start having fun with schema. I love that call out. Um, I do want to offer though, remember that anything you put into chat GPT then belongs to <laughs> open AI. <laughs> so be careful. Don't be like Samsung. Yeah. And, just keep uh, using Samsung data. It's fine. Parts of your source code. It's totally fine. Um, <laughs> But this has been great. Thank you so much. Daniel, where can others find you on the internet and connect with you should they want to or follow your brilliance because really your posts are fantastic and I love them. So they should, everybody should okay. follow you. You can find me by Googling my name, literally. No, that's, well, that's very just snarky wild. response of an SEO. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so Twitter, LinkedIn, that's where I'm usually at. More LinkedIn these days. So if you search for Daniel K. Chung, that's where you'll find me. Otherwise, I do have a YouTube channel called Scheming Schemers, where I pretty much show you the behind the scenes of me learning how to write certain schema based on a problem I'm trying to solve. So it's mostly me swearing and trying to figure out why there's a missing comma <laughs> somewhere. Oh my I know God. That pain. What do commas yeah. mean? What? <laughs> <laughs> then your eyes start to. Yes. Or like one too many brackets. Yeah. 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 I feel yeah. That's where, it, again, if it's not sensitive information, you can put that into ChatGDP and it will fix it for you. Yes. Awesome. Wonderful call. Well, again. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was a, this was a lot of fun. Yes. We'll have to have you come back and let, and give us the update on how Adobe's doing as much as, you know, you're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> And Should you let which... SEOs describe how things are going? Oh my God. <laughs> fires, fires everywhere. It only happens with every website, so it's fine. Yeah. Oh.
Well, thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. And tune in next time for another episode of Opinionated SEO Opinions. And if you have any questions, please send them our way at thegray.company slash ask SEO questions. And thank you so much for tuning in.